Okay, welcome uh, everyone for this um, other webinar of uh, CER, the, the Center on Regulation in Europe. So today we, we will deal with uh, a topic which is more and more important uh, in the academic level, in the corporate sphere, and also at the policy level. Um, and also that's why we, we choose to, to deal with this topic. So um, first, as always, with the CER webinar, uh, we will have a presentation of a new report which has been uh, drafted by uh, two uh, renowned academics and, and SER research fellow. Um, and as always, in the spirit of SER, um, those reports are written by an interdisciplinary team. Um, so we have um, Amelia Fletcher from the University of Norwich. Uh, she's an economist of behavioral economics. And uh, Chris, Christoph Bush from the University of Osnabrück and he is a um, lawyer specialized in uh, consumer protection and in, in particular in the field of digital. Um, but also this report, and it's important uh, for, for the audience to know, so uh, has been um, uh, 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 co-financed and written with the input of a number of corporations and regulators, uh, most of them uh, which are part of this of this panel. So it's an interdisciplinary approach, but also it's an uh, with uh, it's academic, but with input uh, from uh, the stakeholder. So how we will run the seminar, so there will be a, a first a presentation uh, of the report by Amelia and Christoph. Um, the report is available on the uh, website of SER. Um, and then there will be a discussion among um, the panelists. Uh, uh, we will start with um, a, a, regular, a national regulatory authority, uh, then corporation, civil society, and uh, we are privileged uh, to have the European Commission uh, who will uh, finish and uh, give um, her view on the report, but also on... Um, uh, what she has heard. Um, and then um, after that first round of, of um, uh, discussion, uh, you in the audience, you are encouraged to ask questions. So please uh, don't hesitate to ask questions via um, the application Zoom, and uh, we will take as they come uh, for the second round. And then at the end, um, the last word will, as always, uh, be with the um, academic authors. So having said that, uh, we can start um, with you, uh, Amelia and Christoph, if you can um, present you the main finding of the report. Many thanks. Yeah, many uh, thanks, Alexandre. Um, uh, Amelia and I would like to kick off this seminar with uh, a brief overview of our report on harmful online choice architecture. Uh, the report is structured in four parts, and I think you can, can see the four parts on one of the slides. Uh, part one explores the concept of online choice architecture and why it can be harmful. Part two maps and discusses the rapidly expanding regulatory landscape in the EU and identifies several overlaps and inconsistencies. Then building on this, part three formulates 10 principles for effective policy for addressing harmful online choice architecture. And finally, part four draws out a number of actionable recommendations for policymakers. Let's start with what online choice architecture is and why we think that policymakers should care about it. Generally speaking, choice architecture is a fairly neutral and broad term. It refers to how consumer choices are presented. Choice architectures can use many different psychological effects that influence consumer decision-making, such as defaults, ranking, salience, status quo, social influence, and many more. Choice architectures can have different effects. They can be used to nudge consumers towards good decisions, but they can also be used to trick consumers into poor choices and harmful decisions. Now, these harmful choice architectures are often referred to as dark patterns, a term coined by Harry Brignall already in 2010. More recently, he has switched to the term deceptive patterns. In our report, we prefer the term harmful choice architecture, and we explain in the report why we prefer this term. Now, harms can arise on three different levels, user, market, and society. Individuals can be manipulated to make choices contrary to their preferences. This can lead to economic harm, but also to non-economic harm, for example, in terms of privacy. At the market level, deceptive or manipulative choice architectures can erode the trust in the market and distort competition. 
For this reason, the Digital Markets Act has several provisions that relate to choice architectures, such as rules on easy switching and choice screens, for example. At the societal level, choice architectures can have an impact in changing the preferences and behaviors of citizens. So in the long run, choice architectures can even have implications for social cohesion and democracy. Now, there have been several attempts to define harmful choice architectures. One uh, prominent example is the OECD working definition of dark patterns, which is fairly broad, referring to practices that subvert or impair consumer autonomy by deceiving, coercing, or manipulating consumers. Very similar language is used in the recitals of the DSA, but both definitions are somewhat vague as to the mechanisms that influence consumer behavior and to the nature of harm involved. The second part of our report then maps the rapidly evolving EU regulatory landscape and examines different EU legal instruments which seek to protect users from harmful choice architecture. Until recently, the regulatory framework was rather simple, based on two pillars. On the one hand, the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive in consumer law, which combines broad principle-based provisions prohibiting misleading and aggressive commercial practices, and more specific rule-based provisions which you find in the annex to the UCPD. On the other hand, in the field of privacy law, there is the General Data Protection Regulation, which contains a number of provisions that can be understood as addressing harmful online choice architectures, which incentivize individuals to share their personal data contrary to their preferences. Now, more recently, the regulatory landscape has become more crowded and much more complex. In addition, to the two pillars, the UCPD and the GDPR, we now have a new layer of rules for specific sectors, use cases, business models. For example, Article 25 DSA for platforms, the DMA rules on choice architectures by gatekeepers, Article 4 and 6 of the Data Act for data access, the new Article 16E of the Consumer Rights Directive which is modeled on Article 25 DSA, but applies only to distant selling of financial services. And on top of this, there is the apocryphal Article 5 AI Act. Some of these provisions are very specific, dealing with just one category of dark patterns, for example, pre-tick boxes. Others are rather broad. The different provisions differ in terms of terminology, and in terms of harms, which they address, they also differ in how they interact with the horizontal regulations. You have some carve outs, and in other cases, you have parallel application. And finally, the level of protection offered by all these rules um, very much depends on the underlying consumer concept, which is, as you know, a matter of debate and also a matter of a pending case at the European Court of Justice. So in short, the regulatory framework could benefit from some clarification. How could this be achieved? Amelia will tell you what we suggest in our report. Thank you. Thanks very much, Christoph. So in the report, what we do is we develop 10 principles for effective legislative design and implementation. And the focus on implementation partly reflects the fact that we've had quite a lot of legislation and it may be tricky at this stage to try and go back and uh, uh, apply these principles to the legislative design. But we do think they're relevant for future re re legislative design. But in the meantime, with the legislation we have, we think there is room for um, using some of these principles in developing um, both case law and guidance. Um, so the first, um, and I should say that the 20 actionable um, recommendations that we have at the end of the report, we're not going to go into in this short presentation, but they broadly fall out of the discussion in the 10 principles. 
So the first principle is that we don't think regulation should be restricted to just addressing intentional harmful effects. Uh, we identify a number of situations where you can get harmful uh, effects from online choice architecture, where there wasn't any intention to achieve, to create those harmful effects. We also think the general point um, that often holds in law is uh, that intention can be hard to demonstrate, could be uh, just as true, if not truer here. We note that actually this fits with the current legislation. There isn't a requirement in any, I think, of the cur current legislation uh, to show intention for, um, for the legislation to apply. But we then talk about, well, does that kind of, by not including intention as a requirement for, for the application of the law, does that impose a kind of positive fairness by design duty on, uh, on designers of choice architecture? Um, we say yes, in some cases it does, but only in very specific cases, such as Article 35 of the DSA, which is targeted at, at very a particular very large firms, where the potential scale of harm, if there is harmful choice architecture, is very large, and which do also have the resources to, to really think about their design up front and, and really test it. Elsewhere, we think that could be, uh, that would be disproportionate, but we wonder whether the UCPD professional diligence concept could be used more widely. In the other legislation that we see, there isn't really anything along the same lines, but we think it's um, it's useful and could be brought in by thinking about uh, proportionality in those different uh, pieces of legislation. Principle two is that the regulation, so far as it is possible, should be clear about the mechanism of the effect on users of the online choice architecture that is covered, and that it shouldn't be restricted just to deceptive online choice architecture. We feel that online choice architecture can create harm even if it isn't kind of what one would normally think of as deceptive. It can kind of missteer people. Um, we, having said that, we think the terms mis misleading and aggressive within the UCPD are relatively useful and perhaps better than deceptive and manipulative, which is some of the language that has been more, more recently used. But we do think it would be useful if those um, terms were clearly um, expanded or if it was made clear that they encompassed the idea of missteering people. Principle three uh, is that we think regulation should be clear about the nature of the harm involved and who it pertains to. Again, we have a discussion about this uh, average uh, consumer concept in UCPD, and we make the point, which I think is along the lines of uh, what the Advocate General is now arguing in the case in front of the court, um, that actually a the average consumer exhibits behavioral biases. The average consumer um, you know, has has cognitive costs that mean that it may be missteered by online choice architecture. And therefore, we think that is a thing for the average consumer concept and not just for the vulnerable consumer concept. And uh, we also say that we feel non-pecuniary harms should be captured um, uh, within UCPD. And but more generally, one should, we should be clear. Um, we also look at this AI Act Article 5, which we uh, consider to be incredibly broadly scoped, at least where AI is involved, uh, which could create some real overlap issues. Next slide, please. Principle four is that we feel that the law should recognize intrinsic limits to informed and autonomous decision-making. Sometimes uh, some of the um, legislation seems to refer to neutral choice architecture or fully informed and autonomous decision-making, almost as if that is the kind of counterfactual to harmful cho choice architecture. And we think that is typically unrealistic um with choice architecture is a is is necessary online um and can be very beneficial um but it it, it it may be that without any choice architecture um you you actually get worse decision making so we need it's 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 quite del delicate and complex we in this section we also talk about the unfair contract terms rules and what um this uh, implication what this uh these difficulties of real fully informed and autonomous decision-making mean for the 
for a, the term plain and intelligible in that context. And also in this section, we talk about the potential benefit of small frictions in the decision making process to slow you down and to force you to just deliberate somewhat. But we talk about how there's then a trade off between that and a smooth user journey, which can also be uh, very, very um, valuable um, and talk about the need to strike a balance. And we talk about how the DMA, we think, actually strikes a pretty good balance there. But uh, more generally, that is something that needs to be thought about. Principle five is we rec the same point that I've made uh, once and, and Christoph made as well. It's really important to recognize that online choice architecture can be beneficial as well as harmful. And there's two sub points there. First is when, um, when designing and implementing uh, policy, it's really important to avoid discouraging online choice architecture that is intended and likely to be beneficial to users. Um, and that could easily happen if, if laws are designed too broadly. Um, we also highlight that specific legal requirements to introduce particular pieces of choice architecture, such as choice screens, can be very useful. Principle six is that exercises, the exercise of rights should be easy and not undermined by online choice architecture. So we talk about some positive uh, requirements such as the withdrawal button and cancellation buttons, but we also talk about uh, the anti-circumvention rule within the Digital Markets Act, which is a specific rule which um, is, is general, but there is a specific, specific element of it which relates to uh, choice architecture, which essentially says there's a whole bunch of rules here and you can't circumvent those rules by designing your choice architecture to achieve the same thing and just meeting those rules in by the letter of the, the rule as it were and we think that's really interesting and potentially applicable across a wide range of legislation even legislation that one might not think had anything to do with online choice architecture but where online choice architecture could still be used to circumvent uh, that uh, legislation next slide um, I realize I'm running out of time. Principle seven is to ensure that the regulation addresses online choice architecture across multiple user path elements. Sometimes the legislation refers to interface design, um, and that could be seen as kind of an individual screen, whereas actually the, the whole set of screens that one goes through the whole um the whole user journey is really can be really critical to decision making timing context the number of steps that people have to go through all needs to be considered uh, all needs to be covered by uh, the leg legislation principle eight um we don't spend a lot of time on this and it potentially could be a whole separate report, but is um, we think we need to consider special rules for algorithmically personalized choice architecture, so micro targeted uh, choice architecture. This is the idea that we often talk about prices or products or advertising being targeted at individuals, but you could actually imagine choice architecture being designed specifically for individuals um, and really trying to reflect their specific biases, we consider that could be particularly harmful and also particularly hard to police because it would be very hard to ever evidence exactly what, um, what choice architecture any individual had seen. And therefore we think there is a, a, a rationale for strong uh, law in, in, in this particular area. Principle nine is that behavioral testing should be encouraged or even required in specific circumstances and that regulators should be able to test results. This is because actually it's very, very hard to guess upfront how any in, how individuals will respond to particular choice architectures. We have hunches, we know that how defaults work, we know um, that how saliency bias works, but in any particular instance, it can be very, very hard to guess how a choice architecture will work. The only way to really assess it is testing. Um, and that means that, um, that testing is critical to all of this. It also means that authorities may need to have UX and behavioral science experts to help uh, deal with all this evidence. And then finally, principle 10, is as uh, Christoph has already highlighted, there is a growing 
a variety of legislation that covers issues of online choice architecture. There are overlaps, there's risks of inconsistency. There is differences in the use of uh, terminology that mean it's difficult to utilize precedents from one legal instrument in another one. Um, so this principle is to mitigate the risks of regulatory overlap or inconsistency, uh, for example, um, through new legislation and guidance, but also we really emphasize the value of cross-regulator liaison and enforcement. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Christoph and Amelia, for this uh, for this report. So for the audience who, who, who join us um, in the meanwhile, um, I, I repeat, so the report is available on the on the SER uh, website. And as um, Christoph and Amelia were mentioning, um, they are deriving a number of specific policy recommendations from the 10 principles um, that have been mentioned. And so don't hesitate to ask any question uh, via the, the Q&A uh, function of Zoom. Um, if you want uh, to discuss some of them, but first, so let's go to this um, to this uh, reaction from the steering committee. Um, so the steering committee has been involved to some extent in the making of the of the report, in the sense that they were providing feedback uh, to the to the author. But of course, it's only the author which bear the responsibility of the quality and and um, and and the mistake if there is of the report. Um, so let's go to that, and I will start with. Uh, Dries Kuipers, um, who is a, a senior enforcement officer at the Dutch um, uh, uh, regulator for consumer and market, and which has been extremely active since a long time, in fact, on that issue, before it became even fashionable in Brussels. It was already fashionable in Den Haag. So, uh, Dries, what is your um, take of this report? Yeah, thank you very much, Alexandre. And, and thank you to the authors also for giving this very succinct and very good overview of what's in the report. Um, yeah, so there's there's two points really I would like to highlight. One thing that I particularly like about the report and one thing that I think we can build on in the future in terms of legislation. So <clears throat> let's start with um, the element that I really like, which was something that we actually ended on during the presentation um, in terms of principle 10, the, the principle that says that we need to mitigate risks of regulatory overlap and inconsistency in legislation, which I think is probably one of the more boring topics because it's very legal. Um, but I actually want to really emphasize the importance of this point, which was already made by Amelia, but I think I want to further strengthen it. So, of course, companies, you know, acting in the market need legal certainty. Of course, consumers need to know their rights. But I also want to argue this point very strongly from a, an enforcement perspective. Um, taking it this way, so I can already see the number of discussions with other regulators, but also internal departments that we currently have based on the incoming legislation, the DSA, the DA, and how this will all fit together because, you know, this legislation, as said by Emilia and Christoph, it isn't always obvious from the start how they interlink, how they communicate with each other. Um, and if I look at the amount of time, very scarce time that enforcers, enforcement agencies in Europe have, and some people even speak of an enforcement deficit when it comes to consumer protection, I can see quite a bit of that energy and capacity moving to finding out who's responsible for what, what actually the various provisions mean, how they cooperate, how we cooperate as agencies, what barriers we have, how we need to exchange information and what's possible and what isn't. And then also bearing in mind that we're probably going to take up cases to test this legislation. Maybe in some cases, because of the inconsistencies and unclarities, only to find out in six years from now, litigating before the European Court that we mis misunderstood and misinterpreted one certain provision. So it is really important, I think, that we keep the eye on the ball during the legislative process um, to make sure that these inconsistencies are as limited as possible um, and that we have uh, a piece, an entirety of legislation which is enforceable. So, so that would be, you know, my, my, my cry from the heart as an enforcer. Um, 
The other thing is there's one point that I think we may want to focus a little bit more on, which is what I would call fostering compliance in the chain or maybe expanding liability to all relevant operators. So we know that all companies that engage in digital um, selling, in digital retailing, are using other parties to build their retail channels, whether it's an app or a website. They may be using online marketing uh, firms, they may use software, they may build on platforms that offer certain um, uh, plugins, they may use consultancies, growth hackers. There is a, a tremendous uh, business to business supplier chain, which under current consumer legislation is not in any way liable. Now, for, for the potential violations caused by their services and products. So let me go to a totally different area and let me take you 50 years back. In the 1970s in the Netherlands, we had increasing deaths in traffic. Um, people started to worry and wonder, what can we do? What do we need to do? So some rules were uh, imposed on drivers and you know some stricter rules. But I think the predominant change that was being made is that those people who design, uh, who were responsible for road design, for infrastructure design, were actually being held responsible, liable for faults or um, um, failures in design leading to bad accidents. I can tell you that from then on, immediately within five years, the number of deaths on the roads in the Netherlands decreased dramatically and have been very low and stable since. My question would be, why can't we make those people who are involved in designing infrastructure digitally not as responsible as we can make those road designers in the physical world? So um, that's really why, where I want to wrap up. Um, first of all, what I really like is, you know, try and mitigate all those overlaps. It is really important for everybody, but certainly also for the enforcement agencies. And let's see if we can build on, you know, extended liabilities for other parties uh, who are active in this chain that creates some of the misleading online choice architectures. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Dries, for this um, suggestion, also for uh, future reform, but also clearly cooperation among authority will be uh, one of the key words of the next um, five years. So thanks for this. Now let me to turn to um, Kash Am Amlani. Um, uh, Kash is a global competition and regulatory council at Mozilla. Now Mozilla, as we know, uh, has worked a lot on this because Mozilla has a product uh, for which its architecture is important, but also has a foundation where they study a lot um, the behavior of the user. And I think uh, um, your study have been very useful for the academic team and in general for the academia. Um, so thanks a lot, uh, Kesh, for joining us and giving uh, giving us your view. Thanks, Alex. So um, I think one thing we shouldn't estimate, underestimate in this, this paper is really the scale of the task that the authors had, which was to pull together a huge corpus of issues um, into something coherent. And that ranged from you know behavioral economics, digital practices, commercial practices and the regulatory framework and to turn that all into a coherent and useful set of principles which you know multiple agencies and legislators can use going forward and that was no mean feat but luckily we had Christoph and Amelia who were more than up to the task so thank you for your excellent contribution to the thinking in this space and the point I wanted to highlight I think that, that exemplifies that is principle five which is about the criticality of context and if you take friction for example you know that can be positive, it can be designed to encourage user choice, you know, for example, when it allows a user to slow down and um, in, in, and, and to think about the decision that they're making and, and to really carefully consider it, um, which is contrary to the way most user interfaces are designed today. And Bayek has done some good work in this space. Um, but alternatively, and, you know, often in, in Mozilla's experience, friction can be used negatively and designed to kind of thwart user choice by um, putting barriers in the way of, uh, of exercising exercising uh, free choice and that can be in the context of data protection or, or you know choosing the products that you want to use or within products as well um and sometimes you might even find examples of both within the same user flow and so i think the key thing is understanding the full relevant context to be able to take account of that impact and that's not an easy thing to do so i think that principle is, is super super important and I, i'm really glad that that's in there on, on the other hand one area where i think the paper could go further 
um, is on the connection between consumer harm uh, and competition harm. Um, if you think about what drives online choice architecture uh, and harmful online choice architecture uh, in particular, it's normally commercial and business objectives. It, it may be targets of a product manager. Um, it, it could be anything as granular as that. It could be someone's next appraisal. It could be profits. Um, and if you think about that, you know, often what it leads to is, is user interface design that can harm consumers. But it can also be a, a, a case of kind of companies using choice architecture to push out rival companies and, and thereby undermining user choice. So it can be direct to the consumer or it can be B2B and then reaching the consumer and harming the consumer that way. And so I think it can be considered sort of harmful choice architecture can be considered a tool for anti-competitive self-preferencing as well. And that brings in a range of additional tools which regulators can use to deal with the consumer harm that results. And I think that connection is is really interesting and somewhat underexplored, you know, more, more broadly and something that I would love to, yeah, would, would love to see come to the fore in, in the future. So yeah, thank you very much, Christoph and Amelia. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kash. And I think, again, this call of probably linking um, choice architecture and antitrust harm will probably come through in some cases uh, regarding the DMA. Maybe we will we will see. But clearly, this is under investigation by the Commission now, and uh, and it will be interesting to see what come out of this. Um, let's go now to Razvan Antemir. You are a um, manager in public policy at Amazon. Of course, Amazon is doing a lot of choice architecture, a lot of testing to try to improve um, the um, the architecture we are facing. So, um, Antemir, if you can come with uh, your take we, on uh, on the report. Uh, sure. Thank you. First of all, thanks um, for organizing the the study and and the um, the event as well. Um, I, I think maybe one thing to call out, which was not mentioned so far, is that it's quite still quite rare, despite having some examples of bringing such a diverse group of stakeholders together and working together on on such a research. So uh, there are examples. Uh, I think the ACM is a very good example, very driven towards dialogue, and also the commissions. Um, Consumer Summit uh, earlier in April hosted a lot of discussions, but I think Sarah was really practical around the the really many topics that we we had to discuss. Uh, and maybe just to, to get to the point, because we we, we are short on time. Um, as you said, we we think of choice as as an enabler and and something to empower consumers. So you think in in terms of. Uh, presenting choices around sustainability, presenting different types of, of services to consumers. So as the, the core mission of Amazon is to be the most customer-centric company, so we think about choice in terms of how does it make it better for, for the consumer. Um, and I think in, in the report, there are a number of, of principles which um, can can lead to even more interesting discussions in, in the future, five, uh, six, or or even seven. Um, as a company, kind of touching on, on what Dries mentioned as well, as a company, we're, we're also very mindful of, of having had a, a commission and parliament mandate that were very full of, of new legislation, and that, that only adds to the existing um, set of rules. So I think the report recognizes very correctly that we have a framework in place which can serve for, for enforcement already now. And I think the, the point about avoiding duplication and overlap and, and legal certainty is a very important one, even for companies. Um, because when we build leg legislation, this should be one of the principles in mind. Um, there's no added value to the legislation if it cannot be enforced. Um, and al also as a company, you will need guidance in, in some cases while you, you're free to to develop the best services you, you can. So I, I would say that's that's one of the, the most important one to ensure that you both deliver for, for consumers, but also in terms of companies, you deliver uh, a level playing field. And maybe one of the things that obviously the, the report had to to make some choices and you cannot uh, focus on everything, but uh, to Dries's point, we will also have the Consumer Protection Cooperation Regulation Revision coming up in, in the next commission, or at least that's what we, we think. Um, and I think that, that may be a very good uh, occasion to look at the existing rules, many of them have been mentioned and some have not even been implemented yet and and learn about the, the challenges that we, we have around them and potentially the need for guidance and then think in the context of the CPC regulation, digital fairness going after that and, and maybe the revision of, of the omnibus and, and so on. Think about how we integrate these learnings and, and continue dialogues like, like this. So I'll, I'll stay here because we were asked to be short, but 
happy to to continue the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, um, Razvan, for those uh, opinion and advice also uh, uh, on how to how to implement that in the in the best way. So let's go now to Matthew Dowell, um, Senior EU Regulatory Council at uh, TikTok. So another um, big tech, uh, so another um, company which is doing choice architecture all the time. So uh, what is your um, take on the report, um, Matthew? Thanks very much, Alexandra, and, and thanks to the authors and the working group for, for working so collaboratively in, in putting together the report. Um, I, I'd really, I think the message has already come through, but echo the comments we've had from both Christophe, Amelia, Dries, uh, about the about principle ten really about the importance of avoiding overlap uh, and and uh, duplication which you know it, it's a really it's a really difficult topic in amongst that plethora of legislation that we've had over the last few years uh, online choice architecture particularly harmful online choice architecture is a is a really hot topic for everybody um, and understandably so. But, you know, there's only so many times we need to sort of crack that nut, so to say, so to speak, um, you know, and we should really think hard about whether new legislation is needed uh, and only if there's a gap, should we then step in and regulate. And and, and as Drew said, it, that this the duplication and uncertainty, it, it impacts so many different aspects, regulators themselves, legislators, you know, enforcers um, and, you know, as, as a, in industry, you know, when, when we're advising uh, product designers and things like that, you know, having to interpret multiple different pieces of legislation that use very subtle different words to describe essentially the same thing. But we can't be certain yet until we get some case law and some precedents to really you know, d do these words mean the same or is there is there an intentional difference between the legislation? So I think that's a really important principle that that we should think about going forward, you know, really challenge regulators to say, is any new legislation needed or is it sufficiently covered? Um, and building on that in terms of areas that I think we could focus on more, um, kind of similar um, similar theme in terms of we've had all this info this new regulation. Now we need to think about how we implement it, how we enforce it. And I think we need to allow some time for that to happen. Um, it's very easy to implement um, proactive, preventative sort of measures where you're where we're giving industry clear direction so include a button with the following words it's very easy for business to implement that but for industry to to essentially implement broad prohibitions are very hard when you when you bear in mind the point Amelia made about the fact that a, a true neutral design is almost impossible you can't have a website with no color you can't have buttons with with no sort of text or you know you've got to have some sort of design choices made so you know the question I'm often asked is what does this mean you know is this okay here's an example is it okay what do you think and kind of how do we implement that that's what we need to think about is all the theory is great the principles are great but actually what does this mean in practice what does this look and feel like on websites on interface design and that's something that I think will evolve as we see more guidance and precedence and we kind of need to allow a bit of space and time for that to happen I think Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Um, now we, and I mean, it's interesting that this call of, uh, you know, having a, a, how to think about the interaction between the law and, and the, those different law. I mean, this is something clearly we would like to work more uh, at CER because this will be a key in the next mandate. And so maybe we should do a report on legal architecture after online architecture. But uh, this is something I will discuss with my uh, with my colleague. Um, so now I, I go to Kasper Dharzweski, um, Senior Legal Officer at Buck, the, the Consumer Association or the Association of the National Consumer Association, if we want. Uh, uh, and Kasper and um, um, his association, uh, Van Buck, has worked a lot on the, on those issues too, producing a, a lot of interesting reports, which again, were very useful for um, for us in that, um, in that context. So Kasper, what is your uh, take on the report? Thank you very much for this. Thank you for the invitation. Um, first of all, I have to express my admiration for, for this for this work, this the way you have dealt with this mountainous task. Uh, it is it is truly it is truly something uh, memorable, and, and I'm really happy that uh, Beuk was able to 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 comment in the process. Uh, there's there are many 
points to be made. Thankfully, uh, many of the, the best ones have already been taken, but, but covered by my predecessors in this discussion. Um, there are many things we really like in this report. The, the, way it's, this, it's, the way it's being very realistic about the uh, taking the lens of mechanism or effect on consumers, being the intrinsic limits that it recognizes on informed and autonomous decision making, the reorganizing the, the recognizing the difficulties of enforcement of policing micro targeted choice architectures. If there was one thing uh, that I particularly uh, that I particularly if I'm particularly noteworthy and really good is the discussion that the paper offers on the problem of intentionality. It's been this discussion in the policy world has been around for quite some time, uh, not least because of the loaded language that we see in circulation. Uh, to give you an example, we have a lot in the AI regulation. We have a lot of talk about manipulative, exploitative. <clears throat> Um, uses of AI. We also see this in Article 5. Um, principle 1 in the report here tells us to stay away from this parameter. And this to us is paramount because if at any point we were to prove intentionality on the part of the trader, particularly if our aim here is the ambitious one of capturing and preventing specific outcomes at the level of the consumer, well, even before we factor in personalization and other factors that make it even more difficult, this would derail the entire the entire uh, the entire uh, approach. And for that reason, acknowledging fairness by design and the role of professional diligence under the UCPD uh, that is very welcome. If there was anything that I should that I could uh, well uh, nitpick on a little bit is connected to that and more broadly to the matter of future proofing the the discussion a little further if possible in that sense the the framing that is proposed uh, in the report on fairness by design and is that it is tied to the approach of the digital services act whereas the professional diligence is construct of the UCPD could is, is mentioned as some as the as the framework that could take it uh, that take could take over once we're outside of the scope of the DSA um, the two are not mutually exclusive and uh, we are aiming for a horizontal uh, future proof uh, solutions here that would actually plug the uh, serve as a safety net uh, in a face of uh, that would complement existing targeted and specific legislation. So uh, for that reason, we should not assume that the DSA captures all uh, the, the cases where uh, that level of control is being exercised by traders. We can talk about uh, new examples that appear every more and every day, but we can talk about uh, algorithmic contracting, companionship apps. There, there will be more and more situations where the trader exercises a lot of control, but it's not captured by the DSA's framework. Uh, on the future proofing part, um, this also applies to the discussion of harm. The report is fantastic in, in that it has a very profound, rich analysis of aspects of harm and how they are being dealt with. If anything, it leaves you yearning for more in the recommendations part, when where it uh, says that where it, where it says that you would welcome a strict definition of harms in the future discussion. And this I want to leave open as a, as a question for, for further deliberation. Would that be, if we are strict about defining the harms we want to address, will that be a future-proof uh, solution to the problem we are facing? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Casper. Uh, we're leaving us with this, this difficult trade-off, but I will come back to the authors and also, I mean, we are receiving some questions through the chat, so um, please don't hesitate to um, um, to, to, to ask your question, I will, um, I will uh, go with those questions to the author um, at the end of the round. Um, so now we have uh, Robin uh, Schlin uh, Schlinker, uh, product director at the, the Go, um, also the, the Go, uh, an important uh, tech firm, um, um, do, having a lot of experience with chart architecture. So Robin, what is your uh, take on, uh, on the report? Yeah, th thank you very much for having me. I feel like a, a bit of an intruder in the sense that I'm not a legal or policy person at all. I, I build products, so even better. That's 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 what we need more in Brussels, I think. So thanks a lot, and that is also where uh, 
and say we insist a lot to not only talk about on um, among ourselves but uh with product people because at the end of the day you are the one who who do the job of the role yeah if so so if anyone doesn't know dr Kaya, we had obviously we try to restore users privacy and prevent some of the harms that come from the micro targeting from the collection of data and and from manipulating them so so we are generally very excited about all the things that are happening in Euro, Europe in this sphere and uh, you know we really feel that that Europe is leading uh, this field and as, as I'm originally from Germany you know I, I'm very happy to work for an American firm but but see Europe take a leading role here um and so in terms of the report something that that we really like is that um it doesn't just focus on prohibitions but also uh, on positive requirements on how can how can um how can these choice screens or choice architectures be designed such that they that they actually work and that the user in real life um you know has a positive effect from them and i think you know the browser choice screens and the search choice screens to some effect have shown that that this is possible and that this, this does work um and and we're seeing the feedback loops there where where we're seeing what what is happening, and we're then using that information to to make them uh, make them better. So so the principles that we should focus on on positive requirements, uh, and uh, and and the effect on users. That's something we're we're really excited about. Um, if I wanted to pick something to to crit it's not really a criticism. It's more like maybe we could have gone further in this report. Is the the, the topic of effective enforcement, and um, you know, I agree with Dries's point, and other others have made this point around around things need to be simple, um, and especially for a company like us, you know, we don't have a, a legal and policy department of hundreds of people that can prepare for eventuality. You know, we need a simple and reliable principle that we can rely on. Ideally, we'd know what rolls out, when it rolls out, and how we can take advantage of this. Um, so I think sometimes when I look at the when I look at this report and I look at the suggestions and recommendations for compliance and enforcement, they're not all that concrete. They're they're still couched sort of in quite cautious terms. And as a small company, in particular, who's trying to to compete or who does effectively compete with some of the largest companies in the world, it's important for us that this enforcement works, that it's simple, and that that we can rely on it. Um, I think something that we were asked at some point uh, by the European Commission is like, why don't you run a big advertising campaign, you know, within our budget, at least, uh, leading up to this choice screen rollout. And one of the points was we don't know when it's happening, right? Like we don't have a concrete date. And then some things happened on the 1st of April, some things happened in the middle of May, some things happened in June. And maybe for, for a Google or an Amazon, it's okay to just do that three times. Uh, for us, it's not. So we need things to be simple. We need things to be reliable. And so the effective enforcement, effective and simple enforcement is something that we think could have been addressed more in the report. Thank you. Um, thank you, Robin. And indeed, I mean, this is something where maybe we, we need to work a bit more. Um, all of us is to have a kind of maybe a choice day, you know, every year. And, and, and that will focus the mind of the people or, or liberation day, if you want, that will focus the mind of the people of making the choice at that moment. And it's true that when it was these two spread over the years, maybe you, you decrease the efficiency. So thanks for this um, for this suggestion. So now I'm going to you, Egelin. Uh, you are um, at the forefront. I mean, you are the European Commission um, at DG Justice, which is in charge of consumer protection. You deal with this uh, fairness check, digital fairness check. Um, so um, again, two things. I mean, for the report, what is your take of the report, but also everything you have heard so far from, from the panelists and their diverse view, that's what we like in SER. How do you react to this? And maybe you could give it the date on the digital fairness check too, but I mean, that's another thing. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. And also, it's uh, really a pleasure to, to be here, to be discussing with such a wide um, variety of stakeholders. Um, indeed, uh, my impression of the, the whole report and the principles, I mean, I really subscribe to, to all of the principles, in fact, and um, I fully agree that there is a need to be clear about the fact that intention is not required for these practices. It's not only about deception. We need to be clear about the nature of the harm concerned. Context is important. And it's also just not only about user interfaces, but really about the whole consumer journey and this underlying architecture. So basically all of these principles to my mind are sort of like a more detailed version of what we anyway have to take into account in the European Commission, which are the better regulation rules, which require us to think very deeply 
about the effectiveness and proportionality of when we are considering new regulation, but also when we are evaluating the effects of existing laws. So the idea is not to overregulate, but also not to leave out any elements, um, types of practices or, or relevant harms. Um, so in terms of the um, reactions, I think a lot has already been said about the potential areas where the report could have gone further. Uh, what Robin just said about having maybe more concrete guidelines about specific types of um, practices and not just at the level of principles, that would be certainly very useful. And we hear that all the time from companies that they want this practical guidance uh, as well. Um, but there's a reason why it may be difficult to provide that clear statement about whether this or that practice is actually unfair. And that is because the legal framework may not be clear to begin with. And so this kind of brings me into how all this report will feed into our work at the commission in DG Justice. Uh, so as many of you know, uh, in fact, for the last two years, we have been conducting a so-called fitness check of EU consumer law, which is essentially just an evaluation of uh, some of the core consumer law instruments that we have, like the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, like the Consumer Rights Directive and Unfair Contract Terms Directive. But also at the same time, we've had to take into account this uh, expanding and strengthened digital rule book, uh, which includes landmark legislation like the DSA, DMA, AI Act, Data Act, and so on. So um, indeed, we have done a lot during this two years. And it's good that we took the time because indeed the legal framework was quite unstable for a while there. So now we are in a better position to reflect on these principles and to, to see what more should be done in the future. And we have conducted various consultations, data collection activities, um, consumer surveys of you know 10,000 consumers, examining how they have been exposed to dark patterns among many other practices we're looking at. So all of that you can read in more detail, hopefully in September. So there has been a, a small delay uh, in the publication of the fitness check report, but uh, we intend to get it to you as soon as possible. And that will sort of be the basis as far as the justice is concerned on how we look at this issue further from the consumer protection uh, perspective. Now, maybe what I, I would love to share with you now are some of our preliminary findings and how they relate to, to these um, principles in the report. Um, First of all, um, as a starting point, I should say that we are quite optimistic about the state of EU consumer law. Um, and we do not see some kind of um, need for a fundamental reordering of such. On the other hand, we do see that there are real problems on the ground that unfortunately remain. And with each um, new investigation that comes out, you see these crazy figures of, you know, uh, around half to almost all of market participants using some sort of dark patterns. And, and I'm not only talking about commercial transactions, uh, you know, should I even mention cookie banners? You know, we have all these examples of uh, consumers constantly being exposed to problematic practices. However, there is um, a large issue with legal uncertainty, I would say. So there's a lack of clarity, I think, for all market participants on as to what exactly is allowed and not allowed. And we see those kinds of questions in these principles reflected also in our consultations. So a lack of clarity about uh, the role of intention or what kinds of harms are relevant. And that is also connected to another overall finding, which will surprise absolutely no one, uh, which is that there has been insufficient enforcement, unfortunately, in practice. So despite all the hype and the discussions about dark patterns in the last um, I don't know, four years or so, we've only seen a handful of cases out there, many of them, of course, by Dries and the Dutch authority. But all of this begs the question whether the regulatory framework is effective at the moment. And, and closely related to that, we also see the concerns as reflected in principle 10 um, about regulatory complexity and possible overlap or inconsistencies. In some areas also more positively, we see complementarities and reinforcements. But I would agree that taking all of this into account, 
I think there's indeed a rather high likelihood of there being potentially some kind of different decisions or interpretations emerging in the future on essentially the same kinds of practices or even exactly the same kinds of practices, just approached from a different um, uh, law. And so there will, will be difficulties, I think, with reconciling all of that, um, you know, to differentiate and define all these terms used to describe dark patterns across the different laws. Like, like what exactly is the meaning and difference between coerce, deceive, undermine, manipulate, subvert, impair, materially distort? I could go on. And, and all of that will inevitably also have an impact on the application of consumer law, which has been there for a while and already has uh, a lot of case law behind it, though not necessarily in the online uh, uh, choice architecture context. And also, I think it's um, important to note uh, something also Casper uh, mentioned that um, contrary to popular belief, um, the recently revamped and strengthened uh, digital rule book did not tackle, um, nor did it intend to tackle all unfair practices or all types of traders or all types of business models. And it's not a matter of us waiting to see enforcement of these rules for the next few years. As a lawyer, you can already today open these laws, have a look at the material personal scope of these laws, and not to mention the individual limitations of specific provisions, and realize that um, the application of these new rules is often um, limited by the addressees, the risk level determinations, uh, other factors. And this was all by intention uh, by the legislators. It was meant to be proportionate and, and targeted. But consumer law, on the other hand, is kind of the safety net in the background that could be used to tackle any practice. And so what are examples of the kind of practices or the kinds of traders that would not be captured by this uh, new laws? For instance, if you look at retail and e-commerce, individual traders' websites and apps, um, as well as various kinds of digital services that are not intermediation services or core platform services. Just to give a few examples, um, you know, media streaming services, video games, dating apps, health and fitness apps, gambling services, um, educational apps, and so on. And, and so there are a lot of, um, let's say, market players which actually have not been affected pretty much by any of these uh, new rules. And uh, last but not least, of course, as you know, um, around 99% of traders operating in the B2C market in Europe are SMEs, of which 99% are micro uh, and small companies. And they have been either fully or partially exempted as well from a lot of these uh, new provisions. So let's see, say the scope of residual challenges um, that remain to be regulated by indeed our already pre-existing general consumer laws and data protection laws. Um, so this, the remaining challenges are quite significant, I would say. And um, indeed, there is also that other aspect, uh, which is maybe less prominent with dark patterns, but certainly with a lot of other topics in the digital sphere, which is the issue of regulatory fragmentation. That in the absence of very, let's say, concrete guidance or steer in the law about what is allowed or not allowed, some member states have gone ahead and taken unilateral action to protect their consumers. So sometimes this happens within the boundaries of the member state's own competences, like in the area of contract law, when we're talking about contract cancellation buttons and what France and Germany have decided to do there. But we at the Commission, we are looking at the whole of the European Union. We're looking not only at whether consumers are adequately protected, but whether there's a level playing field for traders. How much of a diverging interpretation are they exposed to as a risk? And, uh, and so on. So indeed, there's a, there are a lot of issues here without even going into the details of specific kinds of practices. So looking ahead, what's next for us? Um, after we publish the fitness check report, uh, there will be essentially a political decision to be made um, at the EU level by the next uh, political um, leadership that will be coming you know, by the end of this uh, year. 
And indeed, the decision is whether there is any need for further targeted legislation to further concretize the law and to further reflect on the kinds of dark patterns or practices that are undesirable in Europe. On the other hand, what I can already tell you, what will be a key focus for us is enforcement and enforcement not only of all of the landmark legislation that you are seeing every day in the press, uh, how fast and effective that is, but also enforcement in the consumer protection area. And so in parallel to this fitness check, there have been reflections ongoing about revamping the CPC regulation. So to have a more deterrent public enforcement, um, including potentially to foresee also in the consumer law area, some kind of enhanced role directly for the European Commission. So all of this we are thinking about, um, this report feeds into a lot of the other evidence that uh, we have been collecting and the, I would say, different views that are out there right now. And so indeed stay tuned, uh, I would say for the next half a year, because I think some rather important decisions will be made uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very, um, thank you very much, uh, Egerine, on this. Um, and um, we indeed, uh, I'd say we will stay tuned, of course, and we may want to also organize an, an event after the presentation of your uh, of your report, where we can rediscuss all of it with our academic team, uh, and and ideally in presence in Brussels. But can I ask you um, some follow up question, Egerine, and then I will go to the author for um, for the end. Um, um, so the first is, you say, one of the problem is legal uncertainty, and that is something which has been mentioned by most of the panelists, in fact, here. So um, how do you how do you plan to deal with this, if you have any idea? I mean, is it more guidance? Is it um, other things? So that's the first question. The second question, and, in, and I want to um, also rely on the question which were asked in the chat by Chris Taylor, um, he, he said, and, and of, of course, that, that's right, that not every customer is the same. And so whether we need to have, instead of the average customer, uh, um, the vulnerable customer. I mean, this is, as we know, something which is more and more pushed. Um, so if you can react on this, I will ask also to my colleague, academic colleague, to, 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 to deal with this too. But And um, so legal uncertainty guidance. Um, the second thing is uh, vulnerability. And the third question uh, um, I wanted to ask you, which is coming from a question in the chat too, uh, by Andrea Togoni from um, Five Right Foundation, how standard, technical standard, uh, could help in the in consumer uh, in consumer protection. Now, Andrea, in his question, is mentioning uh, uh, a, a standard on age-appropriate digital services, but the question is. Um, more generally, you know, how you think a technical standard can, can help um, the enforcement? Yes, thanks a lot. Great questions. Um, so as to the first question on how to deal with legal uncertainty, good, indeed, that, that will be the main question we have to answer, because that is, at this moment, the only power that we have as the European Commission in this field, uh, specifically of consumer law. We can only uh, legislate or provide guidelines. We don't have any direct enforcement powers at this moment. So indeed, this will be, I would say, largely a political decision, because I think on the one hand, um, if enforcement is boosted through all means possible, I think certainly if you look at an instrument like the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, there are no limits to what you can use it for. And the commission has itself tried to steer it, the enforcement in that direction through its guidelines. However, it's very difficult to also assess the effectiveness of guidelines. It's practically impossible. What I can say is in the fitness check, absolutely everybody, every stakeholder was saying how great the commission's guidelines are. We need more guidelines. Yet at the end of the day, if you look at what has happened on the market, you don't see really a change in the practices. Neither do you see the enforcement authorities, you know, referring or relying on this. Um, so indeed, I think it's, it's just one tool in the toolbox, but I think guidelines alone will not be a solution to all of this. As to the legal side, Again, that's up to the political masters to decide and any legal changes, by the way, would of course have to be preceded by an impact assessment, by new public consultations. So nothing new will in any case arrive before 2026. Um, but if such ideas were considered, then what we see in our consultations, what people seem to be calling for mainly is a concretization of the prohib prohibitions. 
So being just more precise on what is allowed and what is not allowed. And this ties also to the enforcement side. If you have clearer prohibitions, you can have more automated enforcement. You have a more clear legal basis. So you are not taking a risk when you go to court against um, traders. You can be quite confident that you are right. Whereas we cannot really say that right now when you have to interpret the general clause from 2005 and, and put it into the context of some kind of algorithmic uh, personalized uh, uh, choice architectures. Although it is possible, but it's, it's perhaps too difficult. And that also ties to the story of uh, the burden of proof and, and how, how difficult or easy it is right now to, to prove that there has been an infringement, even if you have a reasonably strong case. So remains to be seen, but I think guidelines alone uh, would not be a full solution. So you would need a significant strengthening of enforcement at minimum uh, in, in that kind of package. And how to differentiate between the different consumer needs um, and what of the story of the average consumer and the vulnerable consumer. So this has also been a, a common theme, I would say in the fitness check in our reflections. Um, I think in general, the average consumer benchmark, it was meant to be a normative abstraction. It was never meant to reflect the actual behavior of human beings. This is the homo economicus we are talking about, a rational actor um, who can make their decisions. But of course, as the commission has said in the guidelines, uh, this is not adequate, um, at least in the digital context. So we do want authorities and courts to take into account behavioral insights. Um, whether that's possible without legal um, changes remains to be seen. And in terms of vulnerability, we do see a stronger need to protect some of the classically vulnerable consumers, such as uh, minors. But also, in a way, we acknowledge that uh, all consumers can be vulnerable um, in the digital uh, environment. Um, as for the role of standardization, um, indeed, that is, um, let's say, a source of untapped potential here. And we do see in some of the new uh, legislation, this kind of move to outsource some of the detail that may be lacking in the law to private bodies, to standardization. That can be very useful as a complement, but I don't think it's like with guidelines, it cannot be the only solution. You need courts, you need consumer organizations, you need authorities to also build their expertise in applying the law in concrete cases. And by standardization, Sometimes those questions will simply be uh, moved from their, um, let's say, scope of what they can assess. So it remains to be seen, but indeed, I think a lot of potential for standards uh, in targeted areas. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for being so open on um, where, where your thinking are at this stage. So let me now go to the, to the main author of the report. And uh, um, Emilia and, and Christophe, you have... Um, six minutes together so uh, don't be too long but um just um any of your reaction of what you have heard and and so you have seen the the question and you address the one you you think you can vulnerability um there was an, another question by um by our colleague uh, Stefan Ornick on uh, um, something that Cash mentioned, uh, the relationship between, you know, choice architecture and, and competition and antitrust and when, you know, a bad choice architecture may become an abuse. Um, standard gap, and then maybe also for you, uh, Amelia, a question which just arrived by uh, Christine Dembe, who said, what can we learn from the consumer duty in the UK financial service market that require firm to do a lot of empirical testing? So you pick the one you want, but the important thing is to finish uh, at 45. Um, so I don't know who wants uh, wants to start. Amelia. Okay, a few points. I mean, I think on this average and vulnerable consumer point, I, I agree with everything Egelin said. The thing that I would add is that all of the other legislation other than UCPD doesn't have those concepts at all. And actually, I think they're incredibly useful concepts. So I think what we were trying to emphasize in the report is maybe we could think in some way about getting those that sort of thinking into some of these other um, uh, le areas of legislation, e even if under the heading of proportionality or somehow. Um, on the link to competition policy, uh, this is one of my top favorite subjects and I write on it all the time and I can't quite believe we didn't put more in this report about it, but it didn't seem absolutely on topic. But um, I think that um, uh, it, it's, you know, it, it it is increasingly being recognized that uh, um, 
our online choice architecture is relevant to competition, to abuse cases. There are increasing abuse cases where it is a, a key issue. There is um, a review going on of the Article 102 guidance in Brussels. And actually, um, the, the, that comment prompted me to think I probably ought to be putting in a, a uh, something into that review saying, don't forget choice architecture and say something about it. Um, so uh, on... Um, more concrete recommendations for uh, people like Robin to be able to kind of design to. I absolutely agree. Um, and I do, again, think that the um, the specific prohibited um, uh, practices in the UCPD are a really useful thing. And again, we pointed out that no other legislation has that. Um, we did wonder whether there were any particular practices that we wanted to recommend adding um, to UCPD, but we didn't come up with any. We actually were concerned that there was a kind of a lack of evidence, empirical evidence out there to enable us to make those sorts of recommendations. So one of our recommendations was these sorts of prohibited practices are incredibly useful, particularly to smaller firms, um, but we need more empirical work um, to help us work out what should be in those, in those buckets and what shouldn't. Um, and finally, Dries's point on liability, I think is a really good one, but goes way beyond online choice architecture. Uh, I would note that the DSA does do a few things to uh, introduce liability onto platforms and in terms of um, the way in which they work with users, business users of those platforms. But I agree with him that we could go further on that. Christoph. Thank you, Christoph. Yeah, um, there's so many things have been said. Uh, uh, I, I will focus only on two or three uh, points. Uh, one is uh, the question, is there a need more for concrete guidance? Yes, I think there is, uh, especially with regard to some categories of uh, online choice uh, architectures. Uh, you know, there are these long lists of uh, examples, uh, various taxonomies, uh, and, and if, if you go through them, uh, you, you come across uh, some fairly easy and straightforward uh, examples, but then there are things like gamification. Uh, gamification on e-commerce uh, platforms, for example. For, for me, it is rather unclear where, where the boundaries uh, are um, uh, set by the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive. What is really harmful? What is not so harmful? Uh, I think that's an area where we definitely would need more guidance. But as Emilia said, we need more empirical evidence uh, here. And that is why we, we, we uh, have this principle on testing, because we, we need some some reliable uh, uh, data on, on what is actually the effect of gamification, to, to take just this uh, e example uh, there. And then the second point that I would like to pick up, that's technical standards. I, uh, I agree that there is, is a trend. We see this in the DSA, but also in the AI Act. Uh, to 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 have technical standards complement legislation. The European Law Institute has suggested this already some time ago. If you look at the at the uh, Eli model rules on online uh, online platforms, there there we try to show how technical standards could interact with uh, uh, legal rules. Uh, uh, one example would be the ISO standard on online consumer reviews uh, that contains a lot of uh, details how to design a reliable uh, online review uh, system. And then one could think about uh, links between legislation and standards that are based on presumptions. If you, if you comply with a standard, there's a presumption, a rebuttable presumption that you comply with the standard of professional diligence, for example. This has to be examined case by case where in which areas this, this is workable, but, but that could, could, in my view, be something. But this requires that the standard, the, the process, how standards are produced is a transparent and inclusive uh, standard. That's, of course, uh, uh, an, another uh, issue. There would be other things that I could uh, comment on, but, but I, I, I leave it there. Thank you very much, um, Christoph. Thank you very much, Amelia. So yes, indeed, we are on time. But as, as I said, I mean, we will surely have a follow-up event after Regaline has produced her paper and um, to, to discuss all of that with all of you. So um, I recall, so the, the report is available on the SER website. This um, webinar will also be available on the SER website and on the YouTube channel. 
Um, don't hesitate also to register for those who have not yet done so um, to the newsletter of SER. We will also produce on the on the same SER website um, at the end of this week uh, a report for the next commission and the next parliament. Uh, as you know, I mean, the think tank in Brussels tends to do that. So and we, we discuss uh, part of what we mentioned here. So um, uh, that will be available uh, on Friday on our website. So thank you very much. Thank you in particular to the SER team to, who have organized that um, and Elisa and, and uh, her colleague for, for having uh, organized that uh, Demain de Med. Um, to um, all the panelists, thank you very much for your engagement. Um, as you say, I mean, and this is what we like to do in the think tank, you know, to engage with different, with all the stakeholders, the big, the one, the, the civil society, the academic. I think it's, it's only with this that you can end up with balance um, and good uh, recommendation and tax in particular, of course, to Amelia and Christophe. I think your job was very appreciated. So thank you very much um, and have a good afternoon or good morning, uh, everyone.